Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council in Town Hall. I'm Rachel Kinderdine, Community Manager. Today, we would like to thank the members of the World Affairs Council of the Desert for joining us. We have a terrific lineup of in-person and live stream programs coming up this month, so please stay tuned for a quick update at the end of today's program. Also, we've kicked off our annual giving campaign to raise money to cover our operating costs so that we can continue to bring you timely, quality programming. Please donate today so that we can continue to bring, bring you this timely and important nonpartisan programming that helps connect you with the world. Help us promote global understanding and civic engagement, which is more important than ever in today's polarized environment. For those who would like to ask questions during today's program, please submit them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen for our audience Q&A in the second half of the program. It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's program. Citizen engagement in a digital age. What do people around the world think about the impact of social media on democracy? We're happy to have Richard Weick, Director of Global Attitudes and Trends at Pew Research Center, and our moderator, Alexander Switchbast, Senior Correspondent for Politics, Technology, and Society, join us today. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. We're honored to have our audience be among the first to hear about the findings of this very important report that Pew Research just uh, released today. So Alexandra, I will hand the conversation over to you and thank you again. Thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you to everyone who's logged on today and special thanks to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council for convening this meeting. I just wanted to spend a minute or less framing the conversation. The subject of social media's impact on democracy is so central to so many of our lives and to the world. It's been an active subject of discussion since at least the 2016 election in America and in many countries around the world where social media has fomented various political outcomes from Brexit in Britain to the political violence um, and ethnic violence in Myanmar. Uh, it was the subject of a cover story in 2017 in The Economist where we put um, under the headline, social media's threat to democracy, we portrayed the Facebook logo as a gun that was being fired in someone's hand. Um, and conversations to that effect have only been continuing in the last five years. Um, the concerns range from disinformation to political polarization to bullying and what impact social media has on democracy, of course. Uh, Pew's own research has shown that people rank social media's effect on democracy second only to climate change and the threat it poses to our world. In journalistic circles, Pew Research is the juggernaut of unbiased, informative information. So it's such a pleasure to be here to direct to be here today to talk about this with Richard um, from Pew Research. Richard, please take it away. Great, uh, thank you so much, Alexandra. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, thanks to the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Uh, thanks to everybody who's online. Uh, really uh, excited to have a chance to talk with you today about uh, this new report we just put out earlier today, looking at what people in different regions of the world think about the impact of social media on democracy and society. As you said, Alexander, this is a topic that's gotten a lot of attention uh, in recent years and recent months for a variety of different reasons. Um, and it's one that people have complicated views about, I think. If you look at this survey, people see some real upsides to social media. They see some real downsides as well. So what I'll do is just walk through a few slides that highlight, I think, those upsides and downsides and highlight some of the key findings from this report uh, we just put out a couple of hours ago. So uh, if you want to go ahead and uh, pull up the uh, slides, I'll start uh, walking through those. Um, Hopefully everybody can, can see those okay. Uh, and if you go ahead and move the, to the first uh, slide, I'll tell you a little bit just briefly about the Pew Research Center and who we are and what we do. Uh, we're basically a research organization uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, we're nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-advocacy. Uh, we like to call ourselves a fact tank rather than a think tank because we put such an emphasis <clears throat> on uh, data uh, and empirical research, and we don't make policy recommendations uh, or, or things like that, which separates us a little bit from other think tanks in, in Washington and elsewhere. And if you go to the next slide, I'll tell you just a little bit about 
uh, the methodology for this survey, and I'm happy to take more questions if people ha uh, have them about uh, the methods that we follow. Um, basically, this is a survey conducted earlier this year in 19 countries around the world, including the United States. And the main takeaway I would emphasize here is that these are all nationally representative samples. So the people we talk to in each country, that sample of people very closely mirrors the demographic composition of a country in terms of age and gender and religion and region and other key demographic variables. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll jump into the findings uh, and we'll start off with some of the criticisms that people have about social media. Um, in particular, what we see in this survey is that people say it leads to less civility, it makes people easy to manipulate, and it makes people more divided. So these numbers you see here are median percentages across the 19 countries that we polled. So you know, across those 19 countries, nearly half, 46% say social media has made people uh, less civil and in terms of how they talk about politics, only 23% say it's made people more civil. Uh, about a quarter say it hasn't had much impact. So on balance, people say social media and the internet have led to less civility in politics. Big majorities say, uh, first of all, that social media has made it easier to manipulate people with false information and rumors, and that it's led people to be more divided in their political opinions. And I think, you know, these are common criticism. I think we all hear of social media. You know, these are probably things we've all experienced in some way, right? If we've gone on to social media and consumed information about politics. And these are, are certainly criticisms that, you know, a lot of the people that well, we talk to in our surveys believe are true of social media and how it's affecting politics and society. If you want to go to the next slide, um, you know, we can see, however, that uh, views about these issues varies uh, pretty significantly across the 19 countries. You know, some countries are more negative about social media than others, and in particular, the United States often stands out in this regard. And you can see that here. This is that question on, on whether social media has made people more or less civil in politics. Americans stand out as the country most likely to say that um, social media has made politics less civil. 69% of Americans hold that view. That's the highest number on the survey. So, you know, here and elsewhere, we see uh, the United States standing out in a negative way. You can see that again, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, this is an index that uh, we constructed based on a number of different questions we asked about the impact of social media on politics and society. And a higher score here on this index reflects uh, more negative views in a country about the impact of social media. So when we do that, we build this index, the US comes out on top uh, in terms of being the most negative of the countries that we surveyed in, in terms of these questions about the impact of social media on politics and society. You can see there's a fair amount of variation across countries. There's some other places that are pretty negative overall, the Netherlands, Hungary, Belgium, uh, in Europe, uh, Australia, and the Asia Pacific region. Those countries stand out for being pretty negative. Uh, in places like Poland, Israel, Malaysia, Singapore, people are less negative. They're less likely to say that uh, you know, social media's had this negative effect. Um, but Americans are the ones who stand out in a negative direction. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can see that this uh, carries over in terms of overall how Americans and others around the world are thinking about the impact of social media on democracy. This is a pretty straightforward question. Uh, you know, what do you think about the impact of social media on democracy in your country? Has it been a good thing or a bad thing? Um, the U.S. is at the top of the list when it comes to the percentage of people saying it has been a bad thing. 64% of Americans say social media has been bad for democracy in the U.S. That's a, by a, you know, a pretty good margin 
the highest on the survey. Although you, know, you have half or more in the Netherlands, France, Australia saying uh, it's been a bad thing. Um, but in most places, you actually have most people saying that social media has been a good thing for democracy in their country. A median of 57% across the 19 countries that we polled say that uh, social media has been a good thing for democracy uh, there in their country, uh, which I think runs counter to a lot of the narratives about social media uh, being you know, very negative for democracy. And you know, look, people in our survey, as we saw a minute ago on, on the first slide, you know, they tend to say that, yes, it's been divisive. Um, you know, it's made people easy to manipulate with false information. Nonetheless, overall, they say it's been a good thing for democracy. You know, why might they say that? Um, I think part of the answer lies in the fact that at a time when people feel like they are fairly powerless uh, in politics, they see social media as a platform for them to have some power. It's something that potentially can empower citizens. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, you can um, see uh, an example of how disempowered many people feel. This is a question we've asked a few times over the years where we, we ask people, uh, how much influence do people like you have on politics in your country? Uh, Sweden is an exception, but uh, in the other countries that we surveyed, you know, less than half of the people we talk to say, people like me have a great deal or a fair amount of power in politics. Instead, majorities and often pretty big majorities say people like me have either not too much or no influence at all when it comes to politics. And this is one example of this. There are lots of other questions we ask as well that I think highlight this fact that people feel like politicians are out of touch. They're not listening to ordinary citizens and ordinary citizens don't have a lot of influence on what happens politically in their country. So in some ways, social media, uh, you know, can be at least a remedy to this problem people see in terms of their country's politics. If you go to the next slide, um, it illustrates the fact that, you know, people see some upsides in terms of the, the impact social media is having on politics in their country. Uh, in particular, they feel like it's making citizens more informed. Uh, more than seven in 10 across these countries say that social media has made people more informed about uh, events in their country. And it's made people more informed about events uh, in other countries as well. Another upside to social media is that you have a plurality, at least, saying that social media has made people more accepting of those from different ethnic groups, different religions, and different races. So it's informing people and it's actually leading to more acceptance among different groups within society. The next slide um, highlights the fact that many people believe social media can be an effective tool uh, in bringing about political change. So again, these are median percentages across all the countries that we surveyed. So, you know, across these 19 nations, 77% say that social media uh, can be effective at raising public awareness about political or social issues. Most say that it can uh, be effective at changing people's minds about political or social issues. Uh, it's, it's good at getting elected officials to pay attention to issues, and it can even influence policy decisions in our country. So, you know, at a time when, again, people are sort of frustrated with politics, um, you know, they, they don't feel like they have much power, they don't feel like the political system is responsive and effective at getting things done, social media can actually be an effective tool. Uh, next slide. And we looked at some differences across countries. Uh, it's also important to note there are differences within countries be between different groups. Often uh, there are differences between different age groups. And it's young people who many times are more positive about the overall impact of social media. And you can see that here in this question. This is that question we asked about the overall effect of social media on democracy. Uh, people who are between the ages of 18 and 29 in our survey are much more likely to say they, they think social media has actually been good for democracy in their country. So if you, you take Poland here at the top of the chart as an example, nearly nine in 10 polls uh, between the ages of 18 and 29 say uh, social media has been good for democracy in Poland. It's just 46% 
among Poles 50 and over. You can see the same thing in, in lots of other countries. If you go to the next slide, you can see uh, you know, more countries where we see the significant, significant differences between age groups, including the United States, which is you know, overall more pessimistic about the impact of social media on democracy um, than other countries. But you know, young people in, in the US are certainly more positive about it than older people are. Um, if you go to the next slide, it highlights uh, changes we've seen in terms of social media usage over time by age group. You know, one of the reasons why young people tend to be more positive about the impact of social media is that they use social media sites more than, than older people do. And the more people use social media, the more likely they become to actually think it has a positive effect. Um, but you also see this age gap uh, declining over time. So if you take Japan as an example, it's a country where we've seen a big change over the last decade in terms of more and more people using social media. And it's gone up a lot among young people, among 18 to 29 year olds, uh, the percentage using social media was just 71% back in 2012. This year, it's 99%, right? It's almost all young adults using social media. But look at the change among older people, among those 50 and older, just 10% used social media back a decade ago, six in 10 do now. So the, the increase among older people has been even steeper. And you can see the same kind of thing in France and Poland. If you go to the next slide, you can see it uh, in the United States and other countries. Um, you know, it's still true for the most part that young people are using social media more than older people, but older people are catching up. So when you're talking about the online population, the, on, the, the percentage of the country that's on social media, it's still disproportionately young people, but older uh, generations are catching up with young people and they're using social media more and more. And then just one final slide I wanted to share with you uh, is actually from a survey we conducted back in 2018 in a number of mostly middle income countries around the world. Uh, this year, for a variety of reasons tied to the pandemic, I'm happy to talk more about, uh, we weren't able to survey as many countries as we'd like, and we weren't able to survey in particular as many middle income countries as we'd like from regions around the world. Uh, however, back in 2018, we actually did a, su a survey in 11 nations uh, which you can see here, which covered a lot of these same issues. And we found a lot of the same general patterns. Uh, people see some real strong, uh, you know, positive things about social media. They see some really negative things as well. You can see that a little bit here on this slide across these countries that we surveyed back then. Majorities in most places said uh, they thought social media had increased the ability of ordinary citizens uh, to have a meaningful voice in politics. But they also said that they think social media has increased the risk that people can be manip manipulated by politicians. So uh, in, in lots of ways, we saw some of the same patterns that we see in the countries we surveyed this year in, in these countries that we surveyed a few years ago. So whether you're talking about more um, economically advanced nations or you're talking about more middle income countries, we've seen the same patterns over time in terms of people, again, believing there are real advantages to social media, but there are real risks as well. Um, and I can stop there. You know, happy to talk more, uh, Alexandra, with, with you about questions you have and, and take questions from the audience as well. Absolutely. Well, I, my first question is probably um, the most obvious one, which is why, in your opinion, is the U.S. such an outlier when it comes to the degree of pessimism that Americans are, are exhibiting in your survey? Yeah, the, the U.S. is really interesting, uh, you know, in this survey, and I think it fits in with other things that we see in our cross-national surveys as well on lots of different kind of questions right now. Americans stand out as being pretty negative about the way politics is working um, uh, in their country. And in particular, uh, Americans stand out for being uh, particularly divided and polarized. You know, we all know polarization has grown over time in the United States and uh, you know, the differences between Democrats and Republicans and the differences between uh, liberals and conservatives in the U.S. Are, are, are very wide on all sorts of issues. And you know, those divisions are wider in the U.S. than we see in other countries around the world. Um, you know, there's a few, few things we've asked in recent years that I think sort of highlight that. Um, you know, we, we asked a question about whether 
people think that um, people in their countries are more divided or more united than they were before the pandemic. And Americans have stood out for the last several years as being more likely than others around the world to say, we're actually more divided now than we were before the pandemic. Um, we ask people in countries around the world how big they think the divisions are between people of different parties in their country. And Americans, along with a few others, stand out as being among the most likely to say, you know, we think people in our country are very divided along partisan lines. So, and then, you know, we actually see bigger differences uh, along partisan or ideological lines on lots of different issues. Take something like climate change. Uh, you know, the divisions between left and right in the United States are greater on that issue than the divisions between left and right in other countries. So, you know, in lots of ways, I think these negative findings that we see about um, Americans in terms of how they think about social media's impact on politics, uh, those findings are reflecting this overall sense about the way politics is working in the United States and, and you know, the way in which Americans stand out uh, for having a, you know, a, a pretty negative mindset compared to lots of other countries right now. And one of the things I found most interesting in reading the report was the extent to which the partisan differences um, were, were pretty acute as it related to the negativity about social media with Republicans and independents being much more negative about the impact of social media. Can you, can you tease that out a little bit more for us? That's right. Yeah, you do. See, you know, as a, with so many issues, uh, you know, in the United States, you, you do see differences along partisan lines. And as you said, on, on some questions, it's Republicans and, and independents who lean towards the Republican Party who are more negative about the impact of, of, of uh, social media on politics. Uh, and some of that might correspond a little bit with age. You know, it's it's older people who might be slightly lean more slightly towards the Republican Party who are more negative in general than younger people are too. So it's about uh, partisanship and ideology, also about age, a number of things that kind of you know conflate with one another. But it's true. You know, uh, Americans are divided on so many issues, and, and this is you know another one of them. I wonder to what extent, too, this this survey was conducted before the midterms. To what extent the fact that Republicans did not hold control of the White House or either Chamber of Congress factored into their um, negativity, both about the ability, uh, their engagement um, in the political process and democracy reflecting their their ability to change democratic outcomes and then also their view on social media to what to what impact to what extent that might have had an impact but, yeah i think that's a great point you you see that in the us you see it in other countries too right if, I, if i'm a supporter of the party that's out of power i tend to be more negative about a lot of things you know i don't feel as happy about the way politics is working if I, i'm supporting the, the party that's out of power right now and you see that in these questions about social media too and as you said we conducted this survey before you know before the midterms and you know republicans didn't control either house of congress or the presidency so you know they fell into that pattern i think of, of opposing parties essentially being a bit more negative about things what about outside of the U.S.? Um, the, in the countries where there was a lot more optimism, was there any commonality that you could point to, or how do you ex are, are are there any common links between the countries where people are expressing more optimism about social media, or are these all their own unique kind of elixir that goes into explaining the public opinion? Yeah, I think it is. It is a lot of kind of unique factors in different countries. You know, a, a few countries that have had um, you know, more negative, uh, or well, have had, you know, sort of uh, closely contested elections in, in recent years, are a bit more negative sometimes about the effect of politics uh, on their society. Um, you see maybe a little bit more in terms of positive views in Asia and the Asia Pacific region than you do in Europe. I think that's the kind of thing we want to do more on, you know, next year, we're, we're going to do a survey um, in uh, early 2023, in a wider variety of countries, uh, you know, back into Latin America, more uh, sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, India, and places like that that we weren't able to go uh, this year. And I think those regional differences are something we we'll want to explore a bit more, but it certainly seems possible that Americans and Europeans are a little bit more negative about things than maybe you see in some other parts of the world. 
I wonder to what extent to the, the traditional media ecosystems and the strength of those um, might be a factor in whether or not people are optimistic about social media, especially as it relates to its ability to inform people and keep people informed about political outcomes and things like that. Um, is that something that you've seen any evidence of in your research? Yeah, you know, I don't think we've we've asked cross nationally, you know, how people view kind of the information they get from social media vis-a-vis -vis traditional media. That's another thing we'd really like to do more more on. You know, we, we know from this survey that people feel like they are being informed by uh, social media. They're 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 more informed than they would be without it. But they also know there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there, right? There's false information that's making it easier to manipulate people. And as you mentioned, something I didn't share uh, in this set of slides, but we've we've released earlier this year at Pew is that you know people see false information as a real threat to their country. You know, we, we did a we we on the same survey actually had a number of questions where we asked people about various threats facing their country. You know, economic threats, uh, public health threats, things like that. Uh, at the top of the list was climate change. That was what people said was the top threat facing their country. But not far behind it was false information. Uh, so we know this is something that people are, are really concerned about. And I think, you know, digging more deeply into to that issue is something we want to do more on. In your opinion, do you think that we're at peak disinformation or misinformation, um, or are we only getting started uh, as it relates both to the prevalence of false information and then also people's concerns about social media? Yeah, well, you know, I, I'd hate to predict uh, whether we're at the peak or not. Uh, certainly people are already saying that there's a lot of false information, disinformation, misinformation out there. Um, you know, experts, I think, have different views, too. I've got, I've got some colleagues uh, at, at the center who do a lot of survey work among uh, experts on technological issues. And if you look at those, certainly a number of, of experts are concerned about the role false information might play moving forward. And, you know, again, I guess what I would point to is it's something that the public is very concerned about. You know, the, if you look at average citizens, um, you know, certainly, you know, they don't necessarily, I don't think, believe we're at the, you know, the, the peak here yet. They seem pretty concerned about the future of false information online. Yes, it's something I've been wondering about recently with the tech firms mass layoffs. You know, we've seen in response to public opinion, we saw a massive hiring upswing as it relates to content moderation and helping police the platforms, you know, human power for policing the platforms. And is there a risk now with the fortunes of tech companies turning um, and some of the layoffs that they're doing that we're going to see less human oversight and intervention um, as it relates to the content that's on these platforms. Yeah, well, I think that's something people, you know, are worried about, right? They're, they want to see, you know, some sort of regulation or some sort of way in which to address these issues. Now, you know, whether the sort of, you know, changes to business models or, or layoffs, how that's going to affect things, you know, I, I wouldn't want to speculate, but, uh, you know, as far as the, the future of, of these platforms go, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, right? And I think that's, you know, you see that reflected in the anxiety people feel about these issues. They see these problems as you know, big challenges facing their country. Um, you know, they see the upsides of social media. I think that's important to recognize as well, right? These platforms give opportunities for people to be more empowered in politics and society. But, you know, they're worried about these, these, these companies, uh, you know, platforms in terms of spreading misinformation as well. So, you know, all these kind of uncertainties, I think, heighten these anxieties that people have about the negative aspects of social media. And in your research work, did you dig into people's concerns about disinformation and manipulation on the platforms? Is the concern more about people within countries using the platforms to spread misinformation? Is it more about political leaders using the platforms or is it more about foreign governments, as we've seen in several election cycles in the US with concerns about Russian involvement in disinformation campaigns and the like. Yeah, well, I think people probably were a little bit worried about all those things. But, 
I think they're especially worried about uh, politicians using this, uh, at least that's what we've seen in international research, uh, whether that's, you know, from abroad, uh, you know, other countries sort of using false information to disrupt the politics of a given country, or, uh, and I think there's a little bit on this in that last slide I showed, based on the survey we conducted a few years ago in middle income countries, they're worried about politicians in their own countries using false information to mislead people and divide people. I think that's a, a pretty common concern that we have. So it's not just you know, citizens themselves spreading rumors, you know, spreading information that isn't true, but they, they worry about politicians using false information um, you know, as a specific sort of tactic to accomplish their political ends, to divide people and, and misinform people. So some of this is really concern about top-down usage of false information. Got it. Um, and of course, this was conducted before Twitter's ownership changed. And we've seen recent concerns about former US presidents being allowed back on major platforms like Twitter. That's right. Yeah, it's important to note that this is, you know, there's been a lot of news, obviously, about, uh, uh, you know, online politics lately, and you know, Twitter's been a big, big story. And this was conducted before all that. So, you know, it, it'd be interesting to go back and see to what extent uh, opinions might change, you know, given the news about Twitter and other things. But, you know, I, I think that some of these, these issues are, are more long running and kind of reflect deep seated either concerns or hopes people have about social media. So you know, at any given moment, you know, attitudes obviously can shift based on what's in the news, but you know, given what we've seen over time, it's clear that you know, these issues uh, are, are kind of, again, you know, deep-seated, long-running things that people are thinking about, uh, independent of you know, whatever is happening in terms of news about social media at, at a particular moment. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to get the audience's questions, but just a couple more from me before we open it up to Q&A. The first is, could you tease out the what you see as factoring into the age differences and optimism about social media? And to what extent is the platform that people are using um, usually with certain, with older people gravitating to certain platforms versus younger ones affecting one's opinion about whether social media is good or bad, or to what extent is it just a generational divide? And we see so many as it relates to um, priorities and concerns about the world. Right, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of these age differences that we see are tied to the fact that young people use social media and use these technologies more than older generations do. You know, as I mentioned, uh, often what we see is that people who use social media and in different ways use technology, have a more positive in, uh, view about the impact of technology on society. And you know, it tends to be younger people who, who, who use these technologies more. So in some sense, you know, they've grown up with these technologies. They're a big part of their life. And you know, they tend to believe, okay, there's some downsides. They, they definitely do see downsides to them but they also are more likely to kind of see these upsides. Uh, and, and they also use a wider variety of, of these types of platforms. You know, we don't have a lot of international data on exactly uh, what platforms people are using, but we know from some of our research, of course, you know, young people are more likely to use some of the newer social media types of, of applications like TikTok and things like that, whereas older people are more likely to use Facebook and some of the social media platforms that have been around for a long time. So there are differences in terms of the different kinds of products products people are using. But you know, the overall point, I think, especially when you're looking across countries, is that young people use these, these technologies more. And uh, yeah, in part, that's one of the reasons why uh, I think they see the more positive impact. This, you know, this experience that they've had is a kind of deeper experience, you know, set of experiences, and that leads them to have more positive assessments. Interesting. Um, and then what was the biggest surprise to you when you saw the results of the survey? Did anything defy your expectations? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's, it's surprising or not, but I, I do think it's really interesting that overall, the United States is an important exception, but overall, people do say they see social media having a good effect on democracy. Because I think, you know, it runs a, a counter to 
a lot of the discussions about social media uh, and a lot of the you know, totally valid criticisms that people have about social media. Again, the people we talked to in this survey, they said it, it's, you know, they're worried about false information. You know, yes, it leads to more divisions. You know, many of them say it's made politics in our country less civil. So they, they see all those downsides. But I thought it was really interesting that nonetheless, overall, when you ask them to assess the impact of social media, they say it's been a good thing. And, you know, I don't know that our survey uh, tells us everything about the reasons why that is. But, uh, I, you know, I think some of the, the things that we find in the survey um, hint at some answers again uh, around the notion that you know, people feel very powerless right now uh, in many places. They don't feel like politics is necessarily working well, and they see social media as a place or you know a tool for getting some things done in politics. You can get uh, you know politicians to pay attention to an issue. Uh, you can get people to pay attention to an issue. Um, you know you can change people's minds and influence policy decisions. So at this moment where people feel uh, not terribly empowered. This is something that can give them some power. Um, and for some people, it's a way to express themselves politically too, which is important. We don't see majorities in, 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 in these countries saying that they use social media themselves necessarily to express their views about politics, but for many people, it is. So, you know, we need to, I think, keep in mind we're talking about the, the real negative effects of social media that, uh, you know, there's these, there are these positive components as well. And to me, that was one of the more interesting things that jumped out of this set of findings. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, Rachel, shall we open it up to audience questions? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much again to both of you for being here today and to our audience for submitting such great questions. So the first one is, do you see evidence in your results that culture influences people's attitudes about social media? For example, American culture encourages people to speak out about politics. Other cultures are supposed to rely solely on their leaders. That's a great question. Yeah, and I think that's something we'd be able to better answer. We had a, a bigger you know, mix of, of countries uh, in our survey. Um, you know, right now, I think the main thing we, we see in terms of this data maybe is less about culture and more about how politics is working in a given country. And if people are frustrated with the way their political system is functioning, if they see it as being divisive and acrimonious in general, that's going to be reflected in how they feel about online politics. That's going to be reflected in how they feel about social media's impact on politics. So, you know, to me, I guess, I guess the first thing that jumps out is like, how is politics functioning in a country? And that really does a lot to shape how people feel about online politics. Um, but I, I don't discount uh, culture as a, as a possibility as well. And that's something I think we can look more at. In a similar vein, we had a couple of questions about this, which maybe it might be that um, when you've completed the, the survey with additional countries, you might have more data for this. But the question is, does the current level of freedom in a country and how long a country has enjoyed high levels of freedom influence their perception of social media influence? Yeah, that, I think, you know, you're probably right that we would need you know more countries to look at that a little bit. And, and this data, we have sort of disproportionately, you know, higher income countries that get relatively good marks, although not, not perfect marks in terms of international rankings of, of how democratic countries are. We actually have an appendix in the survey if you want to look at, um, you know, how these countries stack up on different uh, rankings of the quality of democracy in their country. That's something that, that you can do. Um, but, you know, we, we see some, some negative views about um, the impact of social media on politics in, in this country, you know, in countries that are, I mean, this survey in countries that are both sort of very highly ranked on, um, uh, you know, sort of international rankings of democratic quality and countries that are lower ranked. So right now, I don't know that we necessarily see a super strong correlation, but again, yeah, we're excited about trying to do this type of thing in a greater variety of countries that I think will give us more leverage on sort of how to answer questions like that. Thank you. So another audience member asked, does the parliamentary system versus presidential system impact citizens' perception of the influence of social media? Yeah, you know, 
I guess the, we would need to look more systematically at like parliamentary versus president. Um, but, you know, in certainly in a couple of places that uh, have president, more presidential systems or, or you know, or at least semi-presidential systems like the United States and France, we see some more of the negative ratings. Uh, I wouldn't want to attribute that too much to um, you know, the particular sort of institutional arrangements that they have. But I do think that, again, you know, the divisiveness you see in a country and the degree of polarization you see in a country might be something that's driving some of the more negative attitudes. If you really want to go in depth in it, you could probably trace that back to some of the institutional arrangements that a country has that, you know, relate to its party system. So, you know, it, it's certainly something to think a bit more about. How does a country's, um, you know, institutional, set of institutional arrangements, how does its political system, its party system relate to this? If ultimately those factors are, are leading to greater divisions and greater polarization in a given country, then I think you could say, okay, this is one of the things that's leading people to feel negative about the impact of social media on democracy. You know, certainly in the United States, again, you know, it is these divisions along partisan lines that are a part of why the United States stands out. Um, in a negative way comparatively on these questions about the impact of social media and some of the other questions that we've asked before about you know, how divided is our country, how much do we need political reform in our country, on those kind of questions the United States, it looks more negative than a lot of other places. And part of that, I think you could argue, is tied to certain kind of institutional arrangements that we have in the United States that create conditions where people might be more polarized along partisan lines. Another audience member asked, why do you suppose that the US and Australia are quite similar in results? Yeah, the, the US and Australia do look a little bit uh, like one another on certain of these things. Like on that, that index that we built, for example, it is looking at um, uh, you know, a number of different questions to assess how people feel about the impact of social media and how negative they are. The US and the Australia were sort of near the top of the list. US is at the top. I think Australia wasn't too far behind in terms of overall believing that uh, you know, social media is having this negative impact on, in lots of different ways on politics and society. And I think part of the issue there, again, to, you know, sort of come back to the degree which a country is, is divided, you know, that's part of the reason why we see some similarities between the United States and Australia. Uh, the U.S. is usually the most kind of politically divided among a lot of the countries that we look at. Australia often isn't too far behind. Something like climate change is an example. We see the biggest ideological differences um, uh, in the United States compared to any other country, generally, when we ask questions about climate change. But Australia often, I think, is, is in second place, essentially. You know, it, it also has some pretty strong divisions um, along ideological lines on lots of issues. And those are the kind of things that impact what we see in a survey like this in terms of people, how people assess politics and how they assess things like social media's impact on politics. So that, you know, that divisiveness uh, is true in, in, I think in, in the United States in particular, but Australia reflects that a bit too. Great, so switching gears a little bit, did your survey reveal trends within age, age cohorts that show increasing or decreasing positive and negative outlooks based on increasing participation? or just over time? Yeah, the main trend we have to look at among uh, you know, different age groups over time is really about usage and how they're using technology. But what we know is that that's often, you know, that often corresponds to how people feel about the impact of technology. So, you know, what's really striking is, is the degree to which people have, you know, increased in terms of their usage of the internet and have increased in terms of their usage of social media over time. I mean, it's something we all know, but I think if you look at the report, uh, there's some charts we have in there that highlight it. And, and it, is, it is striking uh, and useful to remember that it wasn't all that long ago when, you know, very few people in these countries were using social media. And over the course of, you know, a decade or so, those numbers have gone up quite a bit. So, you know, I think that the, the key takeaway is that the, the usage patterns have, have you know, gone up a lot among all age groups. They're still higher among younger people, but older generations are catching up with them. And what we know is that when people um, use these technologies, in general, they tend to be a bit more positive about their, about their impact. So, you know, we can't quite say how the, 
the views themselves have changed over time. But the fact that people are using these technologies more and more, I think, tells us that people are going to become more familiar with them and perhaps more likely to see some of the positive benefits over time. Thank you. So this audience member asked, to what extent do you think anti-conservative bias within social media companies themselves, and which have come out in recent revelations about Twitter, et cetera, drive the more negative perceptions of social media by conservatives? Yeah, I mean, that's something I don't think we, you know, we wouldn't be able to speculate on based on any questions that we have about how you know, perceptions of any given company necessarily affect how people uh, view these issues. You know, it could be a lot of things that to the extent we see any ideological differences in our data, you know, it could be a lot of things driving it. So that's, that's a, you know, it's a hypothesis, but I don't think that we really have anything that can allow us to, to tease that out. Great. So we had another audience member asked, does education impact their view of social media, the participants' view of social media? And do you have any data on that? Certainly. We see, yeah, you see differences, uh, you know, in some countries in terms of uh, more educated people, people with uh, you know, secondary or more education, using social media more often, being a bit more positive about it. Again, I think that you know it's probably tied to the fact that they use it. Right? Again, you know, it, it's it's sometimes in some cases higher income people, uh, people with higher levels of education who use these technologies more. Um, you know, that's that's the same kind of gap as the age gap, however, in that I think it's shrinking over time. If you go back a decade or so ago, you might have seen much larger differences along educational lines or income lines. Uh, and what's happening you know, the, over time is that these technologies are becoming more common in societies, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, again, older people catching up with younger people. It's those with less education catching up with, the, uh, with those who have more education, and it's lower income groups catching up with higher income groups. So, you know, over time, we're seeing a, a, a essentially a more representative group of people who are online compared to what we used to see if you go back 10 years or so. So some of these differences along educational lines, along income lines, et cetera, um, they're still there, but they're becoming less significant over time. Great. So have you found in your surveys ways that other countries or the media have been able to reduce the negative impacts of social media? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's a good question. I don't know that we've seen you know, media coverage or, or, or interventions or something like that that's necessarily led to um, you know, more, more positive outcomes or more positive views about social media. So you know, it would be something interesting to look into. And if you, if you look at people we, we survey, I think what they're worried about are political leaders, right? We, we see, again, in some of these surveys we've asked about that people are worried that you know, political leaders have had um, have the ability to create disruptions via social media, via false information um, in their country. So, um, you know, and, and, and people sort of blame politicians a bit for the spread of false information. So if you ask average citizens what, you know, they're looking towards, uh, I think quite often they're looking to their political leaders to try to make this problem better, right? To be, you know, more responsible and to not spread false information to not, you know, do things that create these divisions and to not do these things that manipulate people in their country. So, you know, again, I think in terms of the people we talk to in our surveys, in qualitative research we've done, focus groups, things like this, in order to make this problem uh, better, to the extent that people see it as a problem, often what they're going to do is look to political leaders in their country. Thank you. So another procedural question kind of about your process, but did you survey for if people perceived foreign actor influence on social media um, and how that's increased their distrust in, in different platforms? Yeah, in this particular survey, we didn't, but we have asked that in similar, you know, international surveys. And we know it's something that people are concerned about, right? They're worried about, um, manipulation from both inside their country. They're worried about politicians in their country using false information to manipulate people, but they're also worried about it in terms of, uh, you know, other countries meddling in their political system. Um, you know, things like cyber attacks are also a major concern that lots of people have. So, you know, these kind of concerns about uh, in, in the sort of digital space coming from other countries into our country, whether it's something like a cyber attack, whether it's uh, another country trying to intervene in our politics and spread false information. These are certainly some of the things that people are 
um, concerned about. And I do think it's a factor, you know, to your to the to the question um, in in generating distrust of social media platforms and distrust of kind of online politics, right? So yes, I think it's the short answer. Those types of concerns are part of what people are worried about and part of what you know gives them some anxiety about uh, the information that they see online. How do you hope that this report will be used now and in the future? Well, there's a lot of debate, obviously, about uh, you know, these issues, right? There's a lot of debate about uh, the impact that social media is having on society in different ways, about you know, it's having on democracy and politics in different ways. So hopefully what our report does is it, it shows both some of the things that people like about social media, some of the things they see as empowering about it, and it shows some of the things that they're really concerned about, right? I mean, a lot of the discussion tends to be maybe not entirely nuanced, right? It just, you know, you know, overwhelmingly social media is a, a, you know, a negative thing and a negative force in our politics, or it's, you know, this, this sort of, um, you know, very positive thing that's going to help people achieve what they want to achieve in politics. You know, the average citizens see it as a little bit of both, right? It's both empowering um, and it's divisive. You know, it's, it's informative, but some of that information that's online uh, can't be trusted. So uh, I think what this shows us is that people have a fairly sophisticated look at um, uh, at social media. You know, that they, they understand both the positives and the negatives and some of the fears and concerns they have. So when, you know, leaders, uh, whether it's elected officials or people in business, people in, uh, you know, nonprofits are wrestling with these issues, hopefully what a survey like this can do is give the public a voice in those discussions and highlight what people uh, are worried about and both what they'd like to see more of, right? So you know, that's our hope right here. We're not trying to push, um, the debate in a particular direction or towards a particular policy solution. But we do hope that this kind of study can give average citizens a voice in those kind of debates. So that, you know, that's what we like to achieve with our research in general. And in particular on, the, on, the, on an issue like this, that's so important to so many people, you know, hopefully they're able to glean something about what average citizens in different countries are thinking about it. Great, thank you. So another audience member asked, do you have any data about how government regulation increases or decreases public confidence in the credibility of social media? Yeah, that we don't have data on sort of regulation policies and how it corresponds to this. I think that would be, you know, something really interesting to look at. Um, you know, uh, it'd probably be a little bit difficult to, to, to compile, but there might be researchers out there who already have it. Um, and it would be a good sort of next step. I think that's what we would like to do with this data moving forward is, you know, now that we've examined what people think, you know, we've sort of written up what people think about these issues, how does it correspond to other data out there, whether that's, um, as some of your, your viewers have suggested, right? And how does this correspond to data about democracy and the quality of democracy in a different country? Or how does it correspond with, policies in a different country or the different kind of regulation regimes that maybe influence things one way or another or make people happier or, or less happy with the way social media is sort of functioning in their in their politics and in their society so those are maybe some next steps we could we could look at uh, and as I said hopefully we'll have more countries that we can look at in that regard moving forward in terms of people believing what they see on social media or read on social media, did you see any difference in um, what different age groups think of that in this report? Yeah, I don't think we see, you know, too many huge differences in terms of worries along age lines about false information. It tends to be something everybody's worried about. And I think that in general, if you look across the different questions that we ask, um, you know, there are big concerns about you know, disinformation, misinformation, um, you know, among pretty much all groups, right? That, that's, a, that's something that stands out in, in lots of ways, and in particular, you know, using false information to manipulate people. So, you know, that's one where I think no matter what age group you're talking about, you know, you see a fair number of concerns. Thank you so much, Richard. And for our last question, I know that you mentioned you're hoping to expand this research into additional nations. Um, when can we expect to see that that research come out? And is there anything else on Pew's plate um, that we can look for in the coming months? Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, we have another uh, international survey that we'll do 
early next year in, in around 25 countries around the world. And as I said, we're you know excited about that one because we'll be back in Latin America, you know, in Africa and some other parts of the world where we haven't been able to go over the past couple of years due to the pandemic, which has made survey research a bit more complicated in lots of different places. So we're excited about that. We'll ask uh, you know, some of these same questions again. So we'll be able to compare you know, some, uh, the countries that we surveyed this year with some, some new countries next time around. And we'll, as we always do in our, our surveys, ask uh, some new questions as well about the way democracy is working in countries around the world. You know, how satisfied or dissatisfied are people with the functioning of democracy? We're gonna dig more deeply into some questions around uh, representation next year that I think will be really interesting. So, you know, um, basically, you know, issues around democracy are a core component of what we tend to look at in these global attitude surveys. And uh, you know, we're excited about next year because, again, we'll be able to do it, um, you know, in a broader set of countries than we were able to this time around. Thank you again, Richard, for being here and for sharing your expertise and for um, sharing this report with our audience. I know we're one of the first groups to hear about it. So just really appreciate that. And Alexandra, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, no, 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 um, no more from me. I just wanted to thank everyone for listening, Richard, for your time. And thank you, uh, Rachel and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall for hosting. I think it's been a really interesting conversation and sounds like there's even more to discuss and dissect with Pew's future research. So we'll look forward to having a sequel to this conversation in the years ahead. Well, thank you both again. And oh, sorry, go ahead, Richard. No, no thank you so much. I was going to say thanks to both of you. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, online and uh, really appreciate the chance to talk about our work.